So we have a lot to do, Founding Forward does, and a lot of that gets done by a dedicated, generous uh, league leaders. One of those league leaders is the chair of our planning committee, the chair of our education committee, and on our executive committee, and he's gonna introduce our program tonight. Please welcome Mr. Steve Target, Steve. Good evening, everybody. And Firstly, thank you for coming out this evening. It reminds me of that, what's that famous quote from Caddyshack? I think the heavy stuff's not gonna come down for some time now. <laughs> I feel like maybe uh, we're in the middle of that. Jeffrey Rosen has been called the nation's most widely read and influential legal commentator as president and CEO of the National Constitution Center since 2013. Jeff has worked to fulfill the charter granted by the Congress, by Congress, to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a non-partisan basis. This includes the creation of the interactive Constitution that is now a centerpiece of the advanced placement history and government exams. For more than 25 years, Mr. Rosen has been on the law school faculty at George Washington University in D.C. After completing his clerkship with Chief Judge Abner Mikva of the U.S. Court of Appeals, he has written for The Atlantic, The New Republic, the New Yorker and Time Magazine, and his books include writings on Supreme Court Justices William Howard Taft and Louis Brandeis. Tonight, our longtime friend and fellow Union League member, Jeffrey Rosen, is here to speak about his newest book, The Pursuit of Happiness, I believe a New York Times bestseller book. Congratulations. To help us understand the most important idea contained in the Declaration of Independence, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Jeffrey Rosen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, friends. I am so excited to be here at the Union League, which is my second home in Philly, to talk with all of you about the pursuit of happiness. And I want to tell you how I came upon the unusual reading project that led me to try to understand what Thomas Jefferson meant when he put that famous phrase in the Declaration. And then I'm going to tell you about what I learned, and then I'll tell you about how it changed my life and how it can change yours as well. So here's how this unusual project emerged. It was during COVID, and I was reading the section of Ben Franklin's autobiography where he talks about the fact that when he was in his 20s, he set out to achieve moral perfection. And he made a list of 12 virtues that he later increased to 13 about how to be morally perfect. And they included industry, sincerity, resolution, order, cleanliness. He saved the one he found hardest for last, humility. <laughs> he, uh, and he made a chart with the 13 virtues on the x-axis and the days of the week on the y-axis. And he picked a different virtue every week and he resolved to make an x mark on the day where he fell short of the virtue he was focusing on. He tried this for a while. He found it incredibly depressing. Uh, and he gave it up, but he felt that he was a better person for having tried, that this exercise in self-accounting uh, made him a better person. Now, I knew about this system because improbably, I would practiced it a few years ago at the recommendation of a rabbi who uh, suggested that a friend and I try a Hebrew version of the Franklin system. It turns out that there was a Hasidic rabbi, Mendel Leffen, who admired Franklin, and in 1808, at the recommendation of a Polish count, translated Franklin's 13 virtues into Hebrew. And they're practiced today as part of a system of character improvement called Musar, which is the Hebrew word for character, that Jews uh, still practice today. So a friend and I, not knowing it was the Franklin system, tried it. Every week we picked a different virtue. Every day we put an X mark where we fell short. We found it incredibly depressing. <laughs> And we also gave it up after a few weeks, but we too, like Franklin, felt that we were better for having tried. Now, what I noticed during COVID was the motto that Franklin chose to illustrate his system. 
It was from a book by Cicero that I'd never heard of called the Tusculan Disputations. And the motto was, without virtue, happiness cannot be. Hmm, interesting enough. A few weeks later, I was at the Boar's Head Inn in Charlottesville, Virginia, on the UVA campus. And on the wall of the room was a list of 12 virtues that Thomas Jefferson had drafted for his daughters that I'd not seen before. And they looked a lot like Franklin's virtues. They had mottos next to them, like for resolution, resolve to do what you ought and do what you resolve. For, um, uh, he also had uh, silence, when angry, count to 10, when very angry, 100. <laughs> Interestingly, there was one virtue that Franklin on, had on his list that Jefferson left off of his, and that was chastity. But what struck me when I read this list was that Jefferson too, when people asked him to explain his project and when they would write to him when he was old and ask him for the secret, ha secret of happiness, would also offer a passage from that Cicero book that I'd never heard of called The Tusculan Disputations. And Jefferson's passage was a little longer than Franklin and it essentially said, he who has achieved tranquility of soul, who is neither exalted by undue exuberance or depressed by want, wanton exaltation. He is the wise and self-composed man of whom we are in quest. He is the happy man. So I thought, wow, if both Franklin and Jefferson took their definition of happiness from this Cicero book that I'd never heard of, I've got to read Cicero, obviously. But what else to read? Then I found this golden reading list that Jefferson would send out to kids who were going to law school and basically anyone who asked him during the second half of his life, how should I be an educated person? And Jefferson's reading list is very rigorous. He prescribed not only what you should read, but also the time of day that you should read it. And you had to wake up before sunrise, read moral philosophy before sunrise. Uh, in the morning, read political philosophy and history after lunch. Uh, geography and science, after dinner some Shakespeare and poetry for amusement, and then to bed, basically 12 hours a day of reading. What really caught my eye was the section that Jefferson sometimes called natural religion and sometimes ethics, and it was the moral philosophy section. And it began with Cicero's Tusculan Disputations, and then it had Cicero's On Duties, and then Stoic philosophers like Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus, Seneca's letters, and then some Enlightenment philosophers, Locke's essay concerning human understanding, uh, Lord Bolingbroke, Francis Hutcheson, and then uh, David Hume's essays. What struck me, first of all, is that I'd never read any of these books. And I've had the privilege of a marvelous liberal arts education. And I give thanks every day to the spectacular teachers in uh, English, history, political philosophy, law, who inspired me when I was a student. And yet, I'd never read these books of moral philosophy because they fell out of the curriculum by the time I was in college in the 1980s, a long time ago. And I remember in college, yearning for this kind of guidance. I was an English major. I studied the Puritans. I was completely unconvinced by the rigors of Puritan theology. Uh, first of all, because I'm Jewish. <laughs> and also because uh, Puritan theology holds that you're predestined at birth to heaven and hell, heaven or hell. Uh, some, some of us heaven and, and hell, perhaps. But um, nothing that you do on earth, none of your good works or even your faith can change the category that you've been assigned to. And this idea that uh, salvation could only be achieved by randomly given grace wasn't satisfying to me, but I was looking for an alternative to the ethos of the 80s. Remember it was the greed is good decade and kind of you do you was on the horizon and I, I was looking for a moral framework about how to lead a purpose-driven life through reason and reflection, not just by faith alone or, or by grace. And what I didn't realize, because this uh, body of work had fallen out of the curriculum by the time I was in college, is that this is exactly the question that the classical moral philosophers set out to answer. So I still can't quite believe that I 
did this because it's so unusual, but it was COVID and we all had some more time. I was inspired by Jefferson. I woke up every morning before sunrise. I read from the classic moral philosophy. I watched the sunrise. And then I found myself writing sonnets to sum up the wisdom that I just read. And I know this sounds completely weird, but uh, I'd been inspired to start writing a bit of poetry a, a, a year or so ago before this project started by my wife, Lauren, who's, who's here and she's a poet and she kind of gave me the confidence to try to write some poetry. And then I found a, a video that a friend of mine, Barry Edelstein, who runs a Shakespeare theater did about how to write a Shakespearean sonnet. And it's easy that the meter is simple and it's supposed to have a volta or turn in the third verse where you make the argument. And it's just a simple way of kind of summing up the wisdom. It later blew my mind to find that lots of people in the founding era who read this great literature also wrote sonnets, including, first of all, Phyllis Wheatley, the great black poet, the first published black poet who studied the classics of, with, with her master and mistress, allowing her to be educated along with their kids, and then wrote these poems of virtue that inspired George Washington. Alexander Hamilton wrote these sonnets, Mercy Otis Warren, the great anti-federalist, and then my hero, who I'll uh, get to, uh, back to in a moment, John Quincy Adams, would wake up at the White House, read the Tusculan Disputations in the original. He spent a year reading Cicero to console himself after the suicide of his son. Um, and he would write sonnets and then watch the sunrise and walk along the Potomac. And his sonnets are really good. And there's just something about this literature that makes a lot of people want to sum it up. So that's what I did. And I spent a year reading from Jefferson's reading list. And what I learned transformed my understanding of the pursuit of happiness. What I found is that all of these thinkers, the Stoics and the Greek and Romans and the Enlightenment figures all viewed happiness not as feeling good, but being good. Not the pursuit of immediate pleasure, but the pursuit of long-term virtue. And by virtue, they had something particular in mind, and it goes back to Franklin and Jefferson. Self-improvement, character improvement, uh, self-composure, self-mastery, being your best self, we would say today. It, it stems from Aristotle's famous definition of happiness as an activity of the soul in conformity with virtue or excellence. But because virtue and excellence aren't self-defining, I had to delve into the literature to see that it really is a form of emotional self-mastery. And the ancients drew a distinction that goes back to Pythagoras, of all people, uh, between reason and passion. I thought of Pythagoras as the guy who invented the triangle. He also invented the harmonic system and the triads and fifths that make the building blocks of modern tonality were his great invention. And in addition to all that, he was a sage and inspiring figure who lived on the island of Croton and encouraged his disciples to first be good and then live like gods. And the way to live like a god was to engage in the daily task of self-perfection through practice and habits, moderate eating and drinking. Uh, he, had a he was a vegetarian, uh, but he had a prescription on beans, which was so vigorous that once his disciples were stopped and they were about to be caught by the enemy and they came to a bean field and rather than tread on the beans, they surrendered to the enemy and the enemy said, I'll just free you, I'll spare your life if you say one thing, tell us what's the secret, why is it that you won't eat beans? And the uh, Pythagoreans, a woman spit out her tongue and said, I'd rather die than tell you. And she uh, surrendered uh, rather than telling the secret. W why the heck won't he eat beans? Well, some authorities, uh, Lauren just found a, a passage in Iambiclus that says that it's because beans resembled, were used for voting and Pythagoras wasn't a fan of democracy. So that's one theory. But other authorities say it's because beans resembled fetuses and because they have the soul of life in them, then you have to express respect for life. Regardless of, of that un, unusual injunction, and I do recommend Ovid's Metamorphosis has the most glorious uh, chapter 13, I think, that talks about Pythagoras and, and his inspiration. But Pythagoras's central contribution to moral philosophy was this distinction between reason and passion. And the idea is that we all have certain faculties or powers, reason in the head, 
desire in the stomach and passion or emotion in the heart. And our job is to use our powers of reason to moderate or temper our unreasonable passions and emotions so that we can achieve the calm tranquility and self-mastery that defines happiness and well-being. And that's why Plato popularized Pythagoras's reason passion distinction into the metaphor of the charioteer with, uh, with two horses, the noble and appetitive horse. And the goal of the charioteer representing reason is to keep them both in alignment. So you see now that for the ancients, uh, it's not that we're supposed to lack passion, but just to moderate our unproductive passions and emotions like anger, jealousy, and fear so that we can achieve resolution, industry, uh, and all those other virtues that Franklin and Jefferson enumerated. I now understood after reading all this that Franklin and Jefferson are channeling the four classical virtues, which are prudence, temperance, courage, and justice, and that is why it was such a practical enterprise. And Franklin, the ultimate self-help guru, is advising people to do what Pythagoras suggested, which is every night to make a self-accounting of the soul so that you can practice on a daily and hourly basis the effort to become more perfect. And Franklin has this beautiful epitaph that he designed for himself, where at the end of his long life, in his autobiography, he said he attributed his whatever success he'd achieved to his conciliating and moderate temper. Isn't that remarkable? The man who was the most famous uh, scientist in the world, he tamed the Gulf Stream, he brought lightning from the heavens, he attributed it all to his moderation. And he said he learned later in life never to be too assertive in his opinions, to say, I think it may be so, or perhaps it appears to me, and by avoiding uh, extreme polarization and dogmatism, he said that he achieved whatever success he had, and then he expressed the hope that whatever errors he made might be perfected in a new and more perfect edition by the author and a beautiful metaphor for the printer to offer up um, summing up the Pythagorean wisdom. So that's the essence of the moral philosophy. And then I set out to see how the founders actually applied these lessons in their own lives. And that's what the book is about. And it just transformed my understanding of the founders and their inner lives. They spent a huge amount of time talking about their efforts to achieve this kind of virtuous self-mastery, to tame their anxieties. They were candid about the perturbations and fears and insecurities that beset them every day and their constant feeling that they were falling short of their ideals. And yet it defined not only their efforts to achieve private happiness, but also public happiness. And I came to see that for the founders, personal self-government was necessary for political self-government. And we can't be balanced and harmonious and productive citizens in democracy unless we first find that harmony and balance in the constitution of our own minds. It's remarkable how uh, central that phrase, the pursuit of happiness, was not only to their uh, spiritual quests as individuals, but also their conception of the republic itself. Let me tell you a bit about uh, what I learned about some of the major founders. Um, so for, for John and Abigail Adams, I, I picked a virtue for each chapter to match with the founder in question. And for Adams, it had to be humility because he was one of the most famously self-regarding men of his age. He was constantly denouncing everyone for not giving him enough credit for the Declaration of Independence, for example. He always said, Adams deserves the credit. Adams wrote the Declaration. He wrote it, spoke of himself in the third person. He um, was mocked as his rotundity because he insisted that the president should be addressed as his elective majesty. And, um, but what's so endearing about Adams is he knew it. He was aware that his vice was arrogance. Those of you who are fans of the 1776 musical know that Adams says, I'm obnoxious and disliked, that cannot be denied. And he's always confessing this to Abigail. There's this amazing uh, courtship moment that they had where they set out to apply Pythagoras's system of self-accounting before bed. 
and resolved to make lists of each other's faults. Uh, a dangerous thing to do in, during any dating. <laughs> and uh, they, Ab, John makes a list of Abigail's faults and sends them to her. And he says, you know, you haven't been practicing the piano enough or you're not tending enough to your reading, plus you're pigeon toed. And she like takes it in stride. She's remarkably self-possessed. She says, I'll try to practice more and I know I have to read more. But as for a lady's posture, a gentleman should never comment on it. Uh, but, but it's part of their mutual quest to achieve uh, perfection together and to find the greatest romance and intellectual friendship of their age. Adams also had a friendship with Mercy Otis Warren, the great anti-federalist, um, who was classically educated with her brother, James Otis, the guy who gave the speech denouncing the writs of assistance, which Adams said sparked the revolution. And Mercy's not allowed to go to Harvard because women can't in those days, but she got a great classical education with James. And she then writes these satirical poems about the revolution that John commissions and praises her for. He calls her the poetic genius of the revolution for writing plays like The Adulator and other light classics. And they're friends during the revolution and then they fall out over politics because Adams beats Jefferson and Mercy is an anti-federalist who believes that Adams is a monarchist who wants to consolidate too much power in the federal government. And when she writes this in her history of the United States, Adams just loses it. He storms, how dare you call Adams a monarchist? You know, no one's more devoted to republicanism. And they fight back and forth by letters and eventually split. Years later, Abigail engineers a reconciliation. She sends Mercy a lock of their hair, which is very moving. And they make up, because Adams is really aware that he's vain and he, he recognizes his excesses. And in this beautiful sign of Adams' capacity for friendship, Mercy says, I've just got one uh, favor to ask you. I just went to the Boston Athenaeum and some guy has taken credit for writing my play, The Adulator, and he put his name on the title page. You're the only one who knows that I wrote it. Can you certify this? And Adams says, absolutely. Um, I insist, and he rides into Boston, gets off his horse, strides into the Boston of Athenaeum, and writes on the title page, this was written by Mercy Otis Warren, a beautiful tribute and a sign of their reconciliation. The greatest reconciliation that Adams had, of course, was with Thomas Jefferson. And among the most moving moments in American letters is their correspondence after they reconciled um, after the election of 1800, where they had a total break for years. What so struck me in reading their correspondence is how incredibly rigorous they were about their reading into their 80s. It's so moving. They're, Adams is in his 80s, Jefferson in his late 70s. They're still getting up before sunrise um, and reading and then exchanging ideas about the books they've read. And what do they want to talk about? Uh, the pursuit of happiness, and in particular, the similarities among the Eastern and Western wisdom traditions about spirituality and happiness. And Adams is so excited when he learns that Pythagoras, who he traced a moral philosophy back to, may have traveled in the East and read the Hindu Vedas. And he's very struck by the idea that the central lesson of the Bhagavad Gita, which is Oh, Gandhi summed up as renounce and enjoy. Renounce attachment to the external results of your action and enjoy eternal freedom and salvation. And Adams, when he learns that Pythagoras may have read the Vedas, thinks that it will prove his intuition that all the lessons of all the wisdom traditions can be summed up in the sentence that Adams expressed as love God and all his creatures. But Adams isn't sure that Joseph Priestley, who wrote about the Vedas, had lived long enough to complete his translation of the Bhagavad Gita. And Jefferson says, good news, Priestley lived, the translation exists, I'll send it to you from Paris. And Adams is so, so moved that this will show the connection that he'd long been yearning for. It's overwhelmingly inspirational on a few levels. First, because they're just so hungry for books and so eager to read them and also the, the deep breath and ecumenical uh, capaciousness of their spiritual vision and their pluralism is really inspiring.
So that's Adams and Jefferson reconciling in old age. And it's all about the pursuit of happiness. Oh, and then, and then Adams says, you know, I'm, I'm, this is my mature understanding. Uh, and I would trace my idea that we should, we should uh, love God and all his creatures back to the myth of Cleanth. And Jefferson said, after my long life, I began as a Stoic or skeptic in the Ciceronian tradition, and now I've become an Epicurean. But by Epicurean, Jefferson says, I don't mean a pleasure seeker. That's a libel on Epicurus made by the Stoics. In fact, said Jefferson, Epicurus suggested that we contract our desires so that we can rationally meet them. So Jefferson doesn't deny the role of pleasure, but he says we should pursue rational pleasures, which will lead to our well-being. And this is their, uh, this is their dialogue about happiness in old age. Now, Jefferson, uh, requires us to confront the central hypocrisy of the founders, and that is slavery. And it's important, if you're going to write about the founders in virtue, to ask the obvious question, how was it that these men who were so keen on the virtues of self-mastery themselves held others in bondage? What struck me centrally is that they didn't even try. And all of the enslavers from Virginia, Jefferson, Patrick Henry, Washington, Madison, George Mason, all believed that slavery violated the natural rights declared to be self-evident in the Declaration of Independence. And in moments of self-awareness, they recognized their own hypocrisy. I found a really striking quotation from Patrick Henry. He's just given the give me liberty or give me death speech. And he says, is it not amazing that I myself, who believe that slavery violates natural law, myself own slaves, I will not justify it, I will not attempt to. It's simple avarice. I cannot do with the inconvenience of living without them. That was it. He just liked the lifestyle and didn't want to give it up and knew it was wrong and felt bad about it but couldn't be bothered actually to abandon it. And that was Jefferson's central vice. It was avarice and greed. He was addicted to living beyond his means and constructed at Monticello this Palladian fantasy of a Greek or Roman villa, which he was filling with luxuries from Paris, all the while he was served not only by an enslaved population, but by his own children. And the people who were in the house serving him were his kids, were Easton and uh, uh, Hemings and, and his uh, sister. And um, these were the children who Jefferson had with Sally Hemings, who he began uh, a relationship with in Paris when she was 16 and he was 42. And he kept his promise to her to free their kids on his deathbed. She refused to come back to the US with him unless he made the promise. And he did do that, but he freed no other of his enslaved population except for his own kids and, bless you, four of their relatives. And on his death, his entire enslaved population had to be sold to pay his debts and kids were separated from parents and all of his fantasies about uh, balancing his books went by the wayside. I have to share also that Jefferson comes across as worse in some ways on close examination because of the degree of his racism. And here, his encounters with the great Phyllis Wheatley are especially instructive. I told you that Wheatley who read the classics after coming over from Ghana enslaved, wrote these poems of virtue, which he sent to George Washington. He acclaimed her as a poetical genius. But then the city of Boston felt that, how could Wheatley have written her own poems? She had to prove that a black person could actually have written these poems. So the city of Boston holds a trial presided over by John Hancock, who wrote the Declaration of Independence, and Cotton Mather and other Boston worthies. And they examine her about the classics. And Professor Henry Louis Gates imagines questions like, who was Apollo, or name the nine muses. She passes with flying colors. They attest that she has written these poems. And then she becomes an international celebrity. Henry Louis Gates calls her the Oprah Winfrey of her age. And she goes to London, and she's acclaimed by the uh, Duke and Duchess, and her, her genius is recognized by all except one person, and that's Thomas Jefferson. And in his notes on the state of Virginia, he has this jarring 
shocking passage where he says, Wheatley's poetry is beneath contempt because black people are intellectually inferior to white people. He says, I venture this is a suspicion only. He'd likely to be proved wrong. But he says, in contrast to the great white poets of Rome who were enslaved like Terence, black people can't be good poets. It's just appalling and uh, impossible to square with the high ideals of the author of the Declaration, even as in moments of candor he recognized his own hypocrisy. Contrast what Jefferson, who becomes smaller on examination with Washington, who becomes larger and greater. Washington, the virtue I chose for him was obviously resolution because of his extraordinary courage in battle. And his central achievement was his self-mastery. He read Seneca as a kid. He struggled to control his temper. Ron Chernow thinks that it was his relationship with his mom who was hypercritical that led him to always be bristling against her, nagging, but determined to compose himself. And it's in his moments of self-composure that he's greatest. There's that amazing moment at Newburgh where the, the soldiers are rebelling. He's afraid that they may overthrow the government. And he mounts this wooden platform called the Temple of Virtue. And he has read to the troops excerpts from Addison's Cato, the poem of self-mastery, which praises the consoling virtues of mild philosophy. And then Washington appeals to the troops for patience and moderation and virtue. Just wait, he says, and Congress will make you whole. And then he goes to read the speech, and as many of you know from the famous anecdote, he struggles to read it. He puts on his reading glasses and says, forgive me, gentlemen, I've grown old in your service, and now I've grown almost blind. And the troops weep. They've never seen him confess to weakness like this. But it's in his moment of self-composed, uh, self-composure that he's greatest. That's his achievement at the Constitutional Convention. He says almost nothing, but it's just the simple self-mastered presence of his calm authority that leads the Constitution to be adopted. And then it, in the farewell address, he makes a plea for virtue. And he says the Republic is going to fall unless citizens can find the virtuous self-mastery that will allow them to learn the principles of liberty and to make to elect wise leaders who will avoid the fate of demagogues. And here is the central concern of Washington and Madison and Hamilton in the constitutional conventions. It's that in the future, because of the turbulent excesses of democracy, a demagogue may come and flatter the people by offering cheap luxuries and overthrow our Republican institutions. And I found this amazing letter from Jefferson where he says uh, that when he gets a copy of the Constitution from Madison, he says, I'm, I'm concerned that there's no term limit for a president because I'm concerned that in the future, an unscrupulous president may lose an election by a few votes, cry foul, refuse to leave office, and enlist the states who voted for him on his behalf. It's really quite extraordinary. Jefferson's solution is a one-year term limit, so the president can't run for re-election. Hamilton, who's also afraid of demagogues like Caesar, uh, wants to have a life term for the president so that the president won't be tempted to steal an election. But both are concerned with the turbulent excesses of democracy, as is Washington. That's why after uh, reading the wisdom literature, I read the Federalist Papers in a new light. The Federalist Papers are a manual for public happiness, a phrase that Madison and Hamilton use repeatedly. And Madison is setting out to address the question of how to deal with turbulent mobs that are animated by passion rather than reason. That definition of faction in the Federalist Papers, any group, a majority or a minority, animated by passion rather than reason, devoted to self-interest rather than the public good, I can now understand as a channeling of classical moral philosophy. The way to avoid mobs animated by passion rather than reason, like Shays Rebellion in Massachusetts where the debtors are rebelling because they don't want to pay their debts and they're mobbing the federal courthouse, the whole Constitution is designed to slow down deliberation, to prevent mobs from mobilizing by the time they find each other to get tired and go home, and to ensure that cool deliberation and reason will prevail. That's why there are all the speed bumps and roadblocks designed to prevent 
direct democracy and to slow things down. Um, Madison says famously, in all large assemblies of any character composed, passion never fails to wrest the scepter from reason. Even if every Athenian had been Socrates, Athens would still have been a mob. And his solution is first separation of powers, checks and balances, the large size of America. He says it'll be hard for mobs to mobilize. And also a new media technology, the broadside press. And he says that because a class of journalists and statesmen he calls the literati can publish complicated arguments like the Federalist Papers in the newspapers and they'll slowly diffuse across the land and citizens will read them in coffee houses and discuss them with their representatives. There's no need to fear that there'll be mobs of any kind because people will slowly succumb to the cool light of reason. Obviously, this sounds very different from our current media landscape of Instagram and X or whatever it's called. And the idea that online mobs can mobilize instantly rather than having trouble finding each other because of the large size of America, and that posts based on passion travel further and faster than those based on reason is a true challenge to our democracy. What we can learn from the founders is the urgent importance of deep reading. And this is the takeaway that I got from their example, Jefferson and Adams, Madison and the newspapers. He thought it was really important for citizens to read primary sources and decide for themselves. Uh, just two more founders and then I'll uh, close and I'd love your questions. Um, I, if I have a, my hero in the book is John Quincy Adams. No one lived the uh, virtues better than he. he. First of all, he studies the classics as a kid. He's consumed by them. He becomes the first professor of rhetoric and the classics at Harvard, where he teaches while he's in Washington and goes back and forth. And as a kid, he's constantly beating himself up because he feels like he hasn't achieved anything. There's this great letter where he's 27 and he writes in his diary, you know, I, I think he's just turned down a Supreme Court appointment. He's the minister to St. Petersburg and he says, you know, I've achieved nothing. I'm squandering my days. I'm spending too much time at the theater. I'm not being industrious. I'm being too indolent. It's because his mom and dad were hammering him over the head with the importance of using reason to subdue passion and to achieve perfection ever since he was a kid. He becomes president, he writes his sonnets in the morning, but then he has the unbearable tragedy of his oldest son, George Washington Adams, committing suicide. He just couldn't take the burden of being John Adams' son, being called George Washington, and he descends into alcoholism and jumps off a steamship. And Adams is so distraught and he thinks the world is gonna fall on him but he spends a year reading Cicero, in particular the Tusculan Disputations. The, 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 the symmetries are just remarkable. And Adams chooses as his life motto, a passage from the Tusculan Disputations, I plant for the benefit of future generations. All of his efforts may not bear fruit in this generation, but perhaps in a future one. And then he regroups and he resolves, based on his reading and his reflection, to become the greatest abolitionist of his day. And he denounces the gag rule that forbids abolitionist petitions in Congress. And he introduces a constitutional amendment to end slavery. And he concludes, based on his close reading of the Bible, which he also reads every morning, that slavery violates the promise in Isaiah that the Messiah shall free all the captives. And he insists on that the scourge of slavery be eradicated. He also insists on the urgent importance of teaching the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution as a kind of uh, spiritual imperative. And there's this amazing speech that he gave to the New York Historical Society in 1839 that we just found at the NCC, where he says something like, uh, the Republic will fall unless we teach the principles of the Declaration and the Constitution. Make then these principles as a frontlet on your forehead. Whisper them to your children in the morning and in the evening. evening. Place them on your hearts and embrace their values. I mean, he puts it more fervently and eloquently than that, but it's a serious thing for John Quincy Adams that all of us teach the principles of the Declaration and that we 
inspire ourselves to live by them and inspire our students too. And that's why our work together on civics is going to be so important. John Quincy Adams also has this memorable death where he's gone back to Congress. He's voted against the Mexican War and he collapses of a stroke on the floor of Congress. And his last words are whispered, I am composed. And he gets this from Cicero's Tusculan Disputations. It's the chapter about the way to achieve happiness and overcome grief is self-composure. It's the perfect mindful epitaph for a virtuous man. He's so inspiring. I, I can't end without mentioning the great Lincoln and Frederick Douglass because we're in Lincoln Hall and the League is such a great tribute to both of their memories. What's striking about Lincoln and Douglas is this, and this is important. They're, they're self-educated. They don't have the virtue of a Harvard education. They, have, they haven't read the classics as kids. Lincoln gets the wisdom from the McGuffey Reader, which is the most popular textbook of his time. He reads it on the prairie, and it has excerpts from Cicero, Seneca, Ben Franklin, and all of those works that inspire him to his task. And then there's Frederick Douglass, and you, you, it's just extraordinary. And if anyone tells you that this is a philosophy for the privileged or for the elites, think of what Douglass did, first of all, to learn how to read. The most crushing moment of his enslavement was when his wicked master forbade him from learning how to read. And he felt at that moment like his, he had been re-enslaved because they were trying to shackle his minds. So what does he do? He goes onto the streets of Baltimore and he pays for reading lessons with bread. And he teaches boys, he pays boys on the streets to teach him how to read. And then he finds this golden book called the Columbian Orator. And it encapsulates excerpts from the classics, from Cicero and Seneca and all of the wisdom that inspired everyone else, including a dialogue on slavery where a slave argues for his freedom. And this golden book, which Douglas pays for with bread, inspires him to become the greatest abolitionist and freedom fighter of his day. And he fights and he, the Civil War ends and the Reconstruction Amendments are embraced. And what does he do in his speeches after the Civil War? Talks about the urgent importance of what he calls self-reliance, a virtue that he attributes to John Quincy Adams and to the framers themselves, dating back to the classics. For Douglas and for Lincoln, self-reliance means the pursuit of happiness. It means achieving self-mastery and self-improvement every day so that we can fulfill our talents and serve others. And he does this by making a crusade for the radically liberating power of reading and education. Now, friends, it's time for the takeaway for this project. If Frederick Douglass could buy reading lessons and a book on the streets of Baltimore that he had to save up for with his enslaved bread, what excuse is there for us for not reading? It just blows my mind that I was able to engage in all this reading and write this book lying on my couch in Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia, because all of those great books are now online and they're free. And think of how hard Lincoln had to fight for books. He borrowed books from a farmer and left it out in the rain and had to pay in corn for the ruined book. They're just waiting for us and all we need is the self-discipline to do it. So I had fallen out of the habit of reading outside of my deadlines or my work. You know, I did it in, in school, but it was a long time. And just that unusual practice that I never expected to be doing of waking up early and setting aside an hour or two in the morning to read is a very transformative thing. It changed my life. It's very empowering. And for me, I just need some rules about how to do it. And it's a habit. This is the point of the Pythagorean wisdom. Virtue is just a daily exercise and often requires habits. So now I'm keeping up the schedule, trying to get up before sunrise, uh, or at least early, and setting aside an hour for reading or creative work. And I just developed a rule. I, I read on my phone because all my books are on my phone, but I'm just not allowed to browse or surf until I've done my reading. And that allows me to get a lot of reading done in the morning. 
and it's just wonderful. So try it because not only because it's empowering and um, because you feel better, you know how you feel. I know, I know how I feel when I uh, t 20 times a day I'm surfing and you know checking X or whatever, you just feel like you're squandering your time. You're wasting time. You're, you're not using your talents to the best of your ability. Whereas just an hour or two of reading is stretching and growing and learning. And that's the definition of the pursuit of happiness is being a lifelong learner. So we cannot know what will the future will bring for uh, many things for American democracy and for the world. But what I recalled in reading this great literature and being inspired by the successes and failures of the human and also great uh, founders and predecessors that we've had through American history is that there's one thing under our control and that's how we use our time. And there's a lot of distractions today with these devices. And just speaking for myself, I can try to use my time a little better by doing more deep reading. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. Is that all? That's all. That's all there is. There isn't any more. OK. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Um, yes, uh, right here, Jason. Thank you so much. Um, that was an incredible talk. My question is related to your thoughts on how to be a great reader. So if you could provide like three pro tips on how to be a great reader, that would be awesome. Gosh. And I read a lot too, <laughs> so I especially appreciated your talk. Yeah, I don't I, I mean, I, I, it really is such simply reading. I guess the, the thing is just focus and not getting distracted. It's so important not to browse and, and to keep reading, not to put it down and check email or, or something else. And I guess that that's the central thing. The, 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 in, in history, there were no other distractions. So they read because that was the only thing to do. I think I skimmed more when I was a kid. And now I, I, there's something called deep reading. And, and it doesn't have to be slow. or it, Just when you're totally in the zone and focused, you can do it. And the other thing is to have the confidence that you can understand anything. I felt that I wouldn't understand moral philosophy because I always felt like I was slow in philosophy and it seemed really technical. But just kind of, because there was nothing at stake, I was just trying to educate myself. I just had the courage to just plow ahead and just extract, I was, the goal of the book is just to extract the basic ideas and to be able to restate them in, in terms that I could understand. So I, I think I, I, the message is so, uh, it's, it's an empowering message about the liberating power. The other thing I'm really keen on now is primary texts, like going back to the actual sources so you can make up your own mind. They're so exciting. And it doesn't have to be classical moral philosophy, but in American history, like that John Quincy Adams speech, not just taking secondary sources, but going back to the primary text, having people are nodding, you know what I'm saying. You have the confidence to get by the, if the language is unfamiliar, you can get it. And just, I, I think that's, the, just do it, you can do it and set aside time. And I think rules are good. You know, a half hour, an hour, whatever it is, start with a half hour every day for reading some primary text and see how it goes. Jason in the back. Yes, thank you so much. Your talk was incredible. I have two young sons. One's a senior in high school, one's a junior. Do you have any um, suggestions on how to get your passion huh. into the young men of today? <laughs> Well, the answer is no, I don't, because I can't get my kids to read this book. <laughs> they're, they're great kids. They're 17. They're just graduating from high school. They're wonderful and readers. And Sebastian's a cellist and a musician. And Hugo's a debater. And they're absolutely great, but they won't read the book. But, but, but they, <laughs> and maybe, you know, it's too much for a dad to ask. But, but Sebastian did has responded to primary text. And I gave him, when I was in the middle of this, this collection, bless you, of speeches uh, in American history, including Teddy Roosevelt on the new nationalism. He was like, this is great. We were just studying in history, uh, Roosevelt and the trusts. And now I understand where that's coming from. So basically, he responded to the text itself. I really am a fan of not 
condescending to kids and having faith that people of all ages will really respond to good stuff. So I don't know if they're history buffs or Hugo likes sci-fi, so that would be another way to do it. I do sometimes try to read out loud at the dinner table too, because uh, how else are you going to get them to listen to it? But it's also really exciting to read beautiful stuff out loud. Reading, we read Emerson, Emerson's speeches um, or the Federalist Papers. And that's also a good way of doing the hard stuff, to read it out loud together. One other thing, I, I, when I, I still teach um, some constitutional law uh, classes, and have tried this thing called slow con law, where we read the opinions out loud, both the majority opinions and the dissent. And again, it's an unusual thing to do and it takes some time, but just kind of sitting together and reading the text and then talking about it is a good way to do it too. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Jeff Rose and Chef. Thank you all. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. So, Jeff, are you up on your CLE credits? Uh, no, I, I'd like to get them, but okay, you, you, you can get You them. can do them tonight, Jeff, on your wonderful. own talk. Great. And if you've signed up, uh, our lawyers in the crowd, uh, for CLE credit, uh, please check in in the back to my left, to your right, in the back room. We will see you uh, on Monday for Civil War Roundtable. And once again, please thank Jeff Rosen. Thank you, thank Jeff. You.